the textures of the language, its musicality, its own specific tradition of forms and meters and imagery, the intrinsic modalities and characteristic linguistic structures that make it possible to express certain concepts, emotions, and responses in a specific manner, but not in another. All of these inhere so profoundly in a poem that its translation into another language appears to be an act of rash bravado verging on the foolhardy. Still, we who make that injudicious attempt are the heirs to a long tradition of verse translation. In the modern, po in the modern period, poets like Yves Bonnefoy, Ezra Pound, William Carlos Williams, Charles Baudelaire, Richard Howard, W.S. Merwin, Richard Wilbur, and Charles Simmage, to name only a handful, have proclaimed the value of translating poetry by engaging in it themselves. And there is no doubt that by means of translation, poets have had a profound and long-lived influence on writing in other languages. Consider, for example, the comprehensive defining impact of Petrarch on all of Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries, or of Walt Whitman throughout Latin America in the 19th and 20th, or of Federico Garcia Lorca and Pablo Neruda on poets in the United States after the uh, Second World War. It is almost impossible to imagine what the course of Western poetry would have been without these and many similar cultural and linguistic convergences of poetic form and sensibility. Um, Anne Sexton, for one, was fully aware of this, as evinced in her remarks cited in an essay by Jonathan Quellen, quote, we, meaning North American poets, we are being influenced now by South American poets, Spanish poets, French poets. We are much more image driven as a result. I find that fascinating. It's as if Amy Lowell and Ezra Pound never lived. But. <laughs> um, Neruda is the great image maker, the greatest colorist. That's why I say you have to start with Neruda. And I certainly go along with that. He's one of the great poets our species has produced. It is certainly the case, however, that despite the weight and importance of translated poetry in our literature, the confluence of sound, sense, and form in a poem presents an especially difficult problem in parsing for the translator. How can you separate the inseparable, the simultaneous, indissoluble components of a poetic statement have to be recreated in another language without violating them beyond recognition. But the nodding, sorry, nodding, perplexing quandary is that in the poet's conception of the work, those elements are not disconnected, but are all present at once in the imagining of the poem. Felstener, do you need me to repeat that? You have that? Felt, you know, it all makes perfect sense to me, but I have it in front of me. Uh, so if there's, a, at any point, I say something that seems too convoluted, I'm perfectly happy to repeat it. Uh, Felstener and Bonnefoy have both tell us that in many consequential and meaningful ways, the translator continues the process initiated by the poet, searching for the ideal words the perfect mode of expression needed to create a poem. But in order to achieve this, the translator is obliged to divide constituent parts that were originally indivisible in the poet's conception, and at the same time, move in contrary aesthetic directions. The language of the poem, its syntax, lexicon, and structure, by definition, has to be altered drastically, even though the work's statement and intention, its emotive content and imagery, must remain the same. And clearly, the language has to change and the structures have to change because you're moving from one language to another. 
and no two languages match up. As I say someplace else, not even first cousins like Italian and Spanish match up. As Felstener maintains in the book, Translating Neruda, translating, quote, translating a poem often feels essentially like the primary act of writing, of carrying some pre-verbal sensation or emotion or thought over into words. Anyone who has slowly shaped an original sentence knows what it feels like to edge toward a word or phrase and then toward a more apt one, one that suddenly touches off a new thought. The same experience holds for poets, generating a line of verse, who find that the right rhyme or image, when it comes, can trigger an unlooked for and now indispensable meaning. So it is in the to and fro of verse translation. We're finding how and finding why to choose a particular rendering are interdependent. In its own way, the translator's activity reenacts the poet's and can form the cutting edge of comprehension. That's a great phrase, isn't it? The cutting edge of comprehension. OK, so you have what he said. Is that pretty clear? Yeah. The how and the why of a quote particular rendering is what I would like to examine with reference to my own experience as a translator of poetry. It's thirsty work talking to you. The primary concern for me has always been a fairly obvious but deceptively simple question. How would I write the poem if I were composing it in English within the formal constraints set by the poet? These constraints include, but are not limited to elements of form, such as rhythm, meter, rhyme, stanzaic structure, and line length. I believe that all of these poetic elements, I'm sorry, I believe that of all these poetic elements, the most important is rhythm. Not all poems employ the specific rhythmic organizational devices of meter or rhyme or regular stanza divisions. But I think that almost every poem uses rhythmic stresses and their effects to create a powerful, frequently subliminal aesthetic pull between the tension of anticipation or expectation and its satisfaction or release. It often seems that this in particular is what people mean when they refer to the music of a verse. The beat of a line, whether subtle or emphatic, is to my ear crucial to both the spirit and the letter of the entire poetic statement. It allows structural coherence, even in freewheeling, apparently conversational, even prosaic verse. As the Irving Mills lyric to Duke Ellington's tune explained, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. <laughs> An insight that holds as true in poetry as it does in jazz. I have always believed that in the process of rewriting the poem in a second language, it is incumbent upon me as the translator to hear that beat and transfer an equivalent pulse into the English line. How can one accomplish this when the essential rhythms and metric assumptions of Spanish and English are so different from one another? English, for example, has a much larger number of one-syllable words than Spanish. The effect on the rhythm of the language is incalculable. Think of the stunning effect of monosyllables in the poetry of Shakespeare or Hopkins or Yeats. Powerful lines in their work are composed entirely of monosyllables. The final couplet of Shakespeare's sonnet 147, for example, for I have sworn thee fair and thought thee bright, who art as black as hell, as dark as night. And of Sonnet 149, but love, hate on, for now I know thy mind, 
those that can see thou lovest, and I am blind. In Hopkins Sonnet 44, the pounding first and eleventh lines, I wake and feel the fell of dark, not day. And then bones built in me, flesh filled, blood bring the curse. And in Yeats, the entire poem, the lover's song, with the exception of one word in the last line. Bird sighs for the air, thought for I know not where, for the womb the seed sighs, now sinks the same rest on mine, on nest, on straining thigh. And the first four lines of the second stanza of Crazy Jane talks with the bishop with the exception of one word in the fourth line. Fair and foul are near of kin, and fair needs foul, I cried. My friends are gone, but that's a truth, nor grave, nor bed denied. At that kind of creation of entire stanzas with one-syllable words is impossible in Spanish. It's impossible, as far as I know, in French and Italian. I'm not sure about John. Then too, the metric traditions of to the two languages are entirely different. Spanish counts syllables to determine the meter of a line, but English counts feet. You know about the foot. The foot is a combination of a stressed and an unstressed syllable. And there are different kinds of feet the names of which I am incapable of remembering. I have spent 40 years of my life trying to memorize. That, uh, I, can, I can tell you about an IAM, IAMB, and I can tell you about an anapest. But I cannot remember what the other rhythms are called. One's a dactyl. A spondy, I think, is two stresses next to, next to each other. Uh, one that there's a trope, and I, I simply cannot remember which one goes with which rhythm. But trust me, in English meter, uh, uh, in English poetry, meter is determined by the arrangement of the feet in a line. Despite these obstacles to translation, I begin the attempt to affect the transposition from Spanish to English by reading the poem aloud. Poetry was oral, A-U-R-A-L, oral, long before it was written and visual. And it seems to me that our ears, mine at least, are much more sensitive than our eyes to the temporal movement of organized, artful language. Its pauses, its convolutions of meaning, its cadences, its musicality.